Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Galliford Tri Holdings PLC four year results to the 30th of June 2021 investor presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged, can be submitted at any time using the QA tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Please just type, simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet company dashboard and we'll notify you by email when they are ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. And if you'll be so kind as to give that to your attention, we would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to Andrew Duxbury, CFO from Galliford Dry. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mark. Thanks very much indeed. Welcome, everybody. So it's a pleasure to be back with you. I had a session with you at the end of our half year results back in March. And so looking forward to talking to you about our full year results through to the end of June 2021 and also our strategy for the next five years. So as Mark says, my name is Andrew Duxbury, CFO at Galliford Tri. Actually, the picture you can see just to, to give you an indication on the screen there, that's the roof of the the exchange building in Centenary Square in Birmingham, formerly known as the Municipal Bank. That is a refurbishment we've done from a building that has been effectively derelict for 15 years or so. And just in the background on the left hand side, Symphony Hall, Birmingham. And again, we've just put a new entrance hall and uh, performance area onto the front of Symphony Hall. So I'd encourage any of you who are from the Birmingham area, if you go to Centenary Square, you'll see some really good examples of our work. So, as I say, this is our full year results presentation for the year ended 30th of June 2021. And the highlights are it's been a really, really good year. So thanks to our excellent people, particularly, but also our processes, our supply chain, our clients. We're really pleased with the progress that we made during the year. And we set really strong foundations for growth going forwards from here. So the performance in the year was, was excellent. It was ahead of target. And again, it set really strong foundations. And just to give you some of the highlights, if you look on the right hand side of the slide, revenue at 1.1 billion pounds is 3% higher than the equivalent period uh, in 2020. Our profit before tax is higher than the market expectations at 11.4 million pounds. And really importantly, we hit a divisional operating margin of 2% a year earlier than our target. So really, really strong financial performance throughout the year. Our earnings per share of 9.5 pence has allowed us then to declare a dividend of 4.7p, which is two times covered by earnings. And again, that is at the more generous end of our dividend uh, policy range, which is two to two and a half times cover. And the reason we're able to do that is a combination of the excellent performance and the strong outlook, both of which uh, I'll come on to a little bit later. And we're, as the final bullet point says, they were very confident in delivering our updated sustainable growth strategy. So the excellent outlook combined with the strong platform for growth that we've established through the last year has allowed us to publish an updated growth strategy out through to 2026. And again, I'll come on to that in much more detail uh, in a moment. As well as the trading performance, our balance sheet continues to be very strong indeed. And this has been resilient through the last year. Our average cash balance, our average month end cash through the year to June 2021 was 164 million pounds. And our lowest cash point during the year was around 100 million pounds. As well as that strong cash, we've also got a PPP asset portfolio of 49 million pounds. And that asset portfolio generates me an interest income of 4 million pounds in the year just ended. So a really good uh, return on that PPP asset portfolio. And that strong balance sheet is a real differentiator for us in terms of winning work. And there's examples of us having been approached to negotiate for work because of the strength of our balance sheet. It's also a real differentiator for us in dealing with and, and getting the best supply chain. And I should say during the year, we've managed to improve again our payment performance to our supply chain, such that for the last six months, we paid 95% of invoices within 60 days. So we've made huge strides to make sure we treat our supply, cha uh, supply chain properly and fairly. Also worth noting on the balance sheet that we have no debt, uh, we've got no pension liabilities to fund. So that balance sheet is balance sheet which can be used for the benefit of growth of the company and for the benefit of shareholder returns. So we're very pleased that the continual strength 
and resilience of our balance sheet through the last year. One of the things that the, the balance sheet has allowed us to do is to, to revisit our uh, dividend policy. And in March, uh, we published an updated policy, which was a dividend cover of two to two and a half times. And just to put that into some context, what we look to do with our balance sheet is first and foremost to support the growth of the business, both the investment in our people, in digital infrastructure, and also to look for strategic opportunities where, where we can to accelerate the growth of the business. But secondly, we look to maintain that strong balance sheet through the cycle. So there's examples of construction companies in the past who have not maintained strong balance sheets. And when the market has turned, they face difficulties. So where we, we find that strong balance sheet is a real differentiator in terms of winning work and gives us that resilience in, in the medium term. And what that then also allows us to do is to pay that sustainable dividend to shareholders because we can use that balance sheet strength combined with a strong outlook to, to support a sustainable dividend. So in terms of the dividend that we declared, I've already mentioned that 4.7p full year dividend twice covered by earnings, which is at the more generous end of that dividend cover policy. And it's worth, it's worth noting that through the year through to June 2021, we took no advantage of government COVID support schemes. We, we took some furlough money in July and August that we've subsequently repaid. So there's no uh, government support in there from COVID. We've got that strong balance sheet, as I say, supported by cash and PPP assets, and we've got no pension liabilities to fund. So all of that has given the board the confidence to declare the dividend of 4.7 pence. So in summary, the year to June 2021, really good year, setting the foundations, really good return to profitability, margins improved ahead of schedule, and that continuing strong balance sheet. And what that's allowed us to do is to then start to look forward into the next phase of our strategic development. So our previous five-year strategy was all about that uh, de 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 sort of developing those foundations and getting the company onto a, a short uh, footing. And that's been done successfully. We're not going to lose any of that discipline that we've uh, instilled and embedded through the business. But what we are now doing is looking forward uh, for the next stage of our strategy, next five-year stage. And this is all about disciplined growth, so sustainable growth, sustainable in a socially responsible way and sustainable financially. So we're not interested in, in growth, which is not able to be sustained year on year. It's all about disciplined growth. You can see in the center of the slide there, our strategy is all about delivering high quality buildings and infrastructure, delivering those in a socially responsible way and providing a sustainable return for our shareholders. And what we've done is we've developed four pillars to our strategy. And this is all about weaving and embedding all of our ESG and sustainability metrics into our core strategy. So first and foremost, it'd be developing a people-orientated progressive culture. So this is about focusing on health, safety, and well-being, making sure that all of our people can, can operate safely. And our ambition there is zero harm across all of our sites. Currently, our accident frequency rate is 0 0.07, and we're striving to reduce that further as we go forward. It's also about developing our people we want to retain and attract the best people who can grow and develop their careers with Gallifer Tri. The bottom left quadrant there is about protecting the environment, creating greater social values. So this is all about responsible consumption practices. This is about our carbon commitments, which I'll come on to later on. And this is all about the social value we add back to our communities. So, for example, through employing local labor and the local supply chain. The top right hand side is about delivering excellence. So this is about working with our clients, to deliver excellence and also working with our supply chain to develop our supply chain. And there we use a program called Advantage Through Alignment, which is about giving our supply chain access to our training programs, access to our pipelines so that they can invest in their own businesses. And what we're looking for is our supply chain to come and make a fair return, make a, a decent profit on our sites so that they want to work with Gallifer Tri and that we can attract the best supply chain. And in doing all of that, what we'll do is create and develop, deliver sustainable returns for our shareholders. So this is all about long term sustainable value creation. What I'll do is I'll come back in a little bit more detail in a moment around the particular targets and how we want to, uh, so I'll talk about how we're going to grow the business and what that means in terms of our targets uh, to 2026. But firstly, just to have a think about the market. 
because the market is currently there to support and sustain growth in the medium term. And it's really important that we grow the business with the market as opposed to trying to grow the business when the market is not conducive. So what we're seeing across all of our sectors is there's a real drive at the moment for investment in the UK social and economic infrastructure. And by social infrastructure, I'm talking about things like schools and hospitals, as well as the economic infrastructure of things like uh, roads. And these are exactly aligned to our um, uh, to the key markets that we work in. 90% of our work is with the government and, and regulated sectors. So heavily invested in the government spend, which is coming, which is all about their investment in improving the UK economic and social infrastructure. You'll have heard a lot around the levelling up agenda, and we're starting to see this come through on the ground in terms of actual work and, uh, if you like, money being committed by government. And we're particularly seeing this in the Midlands and the North, and again, particularly, for example, through the health and education sectors. And our business is structured. We've got national coverage across nine regional building businesses. So we're well placed to access that levelling up work in the Midlands and the North of England. Of course, the urgency of the climate crisis is something which is driving spend at the moment. And this is something which we are working very closely on. Something like 80% of emissions from the UK built environment will come from existing buildings. So there's a real opportunity for us to increasingly retrofit and green up the existing built environment in the UK, as well as building new buildings and new infrastructure as, uh, as efficiently as possible. So climate change is a huge driver for our work at the moment, and we'll touch on that in a, in, in a moment. And finally, the government is really focused on productivity. So post-Brexit and post-COVID is about increasing and improving the UK productivity. And similarly, not only are the buildings that we construct and the infrastructure that we construct uh, it conducive to helping improve the UK productivity, we're also heavily investing in our own digital infrastructure, our own um, uh, digital strategy, investing in modern methods of construction, which is all about improving our own efficiency, our own quality and our own productivity. So the markets are there to support the growth that we're looking to achieve in the next five years. And just to bring that into some real sharper focus, you can see here some of our key markets that we operate in, education, defence, custodial, which is Ministry of Justice, healthcare, highways and environment, which particularly for us is the water and the water sectors. So these are all sectors, these are our core sectors. And if you reflect on those market drivers that I spoke about earlier, these are all sectors which will benefit from that increasing government spend. So we're very satisfied that our chosen markets, the markets that we've got core expertise in, have got a real tailwind to support growth over the next few years. So growth of markets is great and growth of markets is, and growth of our, our, our businesses is, is great and that's what we're looking to achieve. But it comes with a real caveat. We're only going to chase growth where we can do that in a risk managed and disciplined way. So if you uh, were on the call that we had in March after our half year results, you'll know we spoke a lot about risk management and about discipline. And we're absolutely maintaining that framework and that foundation. And that's the context in which we look at the opportunity to grow the business. So we're much more interested in growing the bottom line quality of earnings and margin than we are the top line. So we're not gonna chase revenue which doesn't meet our margin aspiration targets. We talked about this slide uh, when we spoke in March. This is all about the embedded risk management framework that we have in the business. So when we go through contract selection, all contracts above 25 million pounds come to the executive board for approval, but particularly any contract which has a risk factor on our heat map. So that might be the geography of the project, the technical uh, requirements, the nature of the client, the terms and conditions, the resources we've got available to deliver the project, any one of these kind of metrics which has a red flag, that contract will also come to the executive board for review, irrespective of value. And this is all about ensuring that we take on the right work, because the best way for us to grow our margin is to make sure we take the right work on in the first place. And again, I'll come back to the order book in a moment. And as you can imagine, we also have significant controls around in-process projects, whether that be timely reporting, whether that be what we call commercial health checks, 
which is peer-to-peer -peer reviews of a project to make sure that we've identified risks and that we've dealt with risks on projects as they arise. And just to give you a little bit more detail, one feature of our order book is that 87% of our order book at the moment is, uh, has been awarded through frameworks. And frameworks are a way that we can procure work in a way which manages our risks uh, and lowers our risk because it's about repeat clients, it's about repeat terms and conditions, and it's about an arrangement where, which is mutually beneficial really for client and for contractor because it's all about working together in partnership. And that for us is a much lower risk way of contracting because it means we're contracting with people who we know and understand and who culturally are aligned to what we try and do in Gallifer Tribe. So a lot of people ask me why, why we talk about this 87% on, uh, of our order book in frameworks. And this slide really just sets out why frameworks are a lower risk way of contracting for us. So our strategy is all about sustainable growth. Um, and that's about growing the business, but in a, in a risk managed and sustainable way. So I just want to spend a moment explaining how we expect to grow the business going forwards. The first thing that we'll do is to grow the existing core of our business. So we had 1.1 billion pounds of revenue in the year just finished in the markets that I've just talked about, education, health, justice, defense. And we can see all of those markets have the opportunity for us to grow and to grow that business um, over the next few years. And that's a combination of the markets have uh, opportunity and some of our business units also have the opportunity to increase their capacity as well. Some of our business units are not quite running at full capacity just yet. So the market is there for us to, to support disciplined growth. But then what we're also going to look to do is to move gradually into what we call adjacent markets. So this is markets that we are familiar with, that we understand, but that we're not quite uh, doing as much work in at the moment. So just to give you two or three examples of the kind of adjacent markets that we'll move into. So the first is PRS, so the private rented sector. So this is a market that we operate in at the moment in terms of constructing PRS apartments for clients. What we're looking to do is to move slightly earlier and do some more of the co-development work, which brings us a higher margin, it's margin accretive, and it's work that we're very familiar with. We're already familiar with the design of PRS blocks with working PRS blocks through the planning system. So actually leveraging our balance sheet and doing a little bit more earlier investment in, in PRS will allow us to move into a market that we're very familiar with, but just to grow our margins incrementally beyond uh, that which we're already doing. Another example of an adjacent market would be what we call the green retrofit market. So we already have a facilities maintenance business which maintains the buildings that we have constructed. So it's hard maintenance, it's building maintenance work uh, that we do. And there's a huge market at the moment for, for greening existing uh, buildings. And so because we already do facilities management in buildings that we've built, it's a relatively small change to start doing that work in, in buildings that we didn't build as well and to start to do that green retrofit. And that might be changing the light fittings to LED lights, it might be changing the ventilation systems, it might be changing from um, gas boilers to, to air source uh, heat pumps and so on. So it's the kind of work that we already do on existing on, on buildings that we're building, but just moving that into the new uh, in, into a newer market. And we see this is an opportunity which will really grow over the next few years. Yeah, as all companies and all, all all property owners have to reduce the carbon footprint of their existing built estates. And the third area I just want to pick up on is uh, water business. So we already have a su substantial water business, um, which operates, we've got five or six year frameworks with Southern Water, Thames Water, Northumbrian Water, Yorkshire Water, and Scottish Water. And what we're looking to do is to just grow our capabilities into, as well as the asset maintenance, into the asset optimization. So this is about, you know, if we've installed valves and pumps on a site. Actually, it's about maintaining those valves and pumps. It's about optimizing the asset so we can use our digital uh, expertise to really monitor uh, the assets and how they're performing. And then we can do the maintenance uh, at the same time. So again, it's a market that we know well, but that we can just expand our capabilities and therefore grow our revenue. So, so we see a route to deliver revenue growth from 1.1 billion towards 1.6 billion by 2026, so roughly 50% growth 
in the top line by the existing markets and these adjacent markets that we are familiar with. And what this will result in is what we can see on the slide, which we consider, which are our 2026 targets. We consider these to be ambitious but achievable targets. So the most important one is to grow the margin. So we'll grow the mar divisional operating margin to 3%. And as I've just explained, we expect our revenue to grow towards 1.6 billion pounds over the same period. But we will absolutely prioritize margin growth over revenue growth. We expect to be continue to be operating cash generative and to pay a sustainable dividend within the range two to two and a half times. So as I say, those top two targets we consider to be ambitious, but achievable. But alongside the financial targets, we've also restated our system, broader sustainability ambitions. So across six pillars of our uh, sustainability uh, framework, which are all mapped to the UN um, sustainable development goals on the right hand side there. We, what we've done is we've set out ambitions across all of these because we strongly believe that if we can achieve these sustainability commitments, we'll be far more likely to also achieve that sustainable financial performance uh, that we know our investors are looking for. So I'll just pick up a couple of these um, uh, areas just to just to um, highlight to you. So at the top there, health and safety, that has to be our, our number one priority as any responsible construction company uh, it should be. So our accident frequency rate in the year to June 2021 was 0.08, which is very good. It's currently trending at 0.07. And of course, we're targeting no harm. So we're, we, we, that will be a, a journey that will take a period of time. But, but of course, we, we strive for no harm on any of our sites. Dropping down to people, you can see our investment there in early careers. We are a member of the 5% club which means we're committed to having 5% of our employees in early careers. So that's apprentices, uh, trainees, and graduates. Uh, at the end of June, we had 7.2% of our employees in such schemes. As of today, 7.9%. And that investment in early careers also allows us to invest in a more diverse workforce and a workforce for the future and develop our own talent um, as we go forward. So that's a really important part of our strategy. In the middle of the page there, in terms of climate change, we committed in June to um, our, our zero carbon targets of net zero by 2030 for scope one, scope two, and operational scope three. So that is effectively the uh, carbon that we control ourselves. So our office energy, our car fleet, our site diesel, and so on. And we're already making huge strides there. 37% of our car fleet is already electric, uh, and that's growing uh, very, very quickly. And in fact, we now have a policy that we no longer will lease or buy other than electric or plug-in hybrid vehicles going forwards. So big strides that we're making to take out carbon from our fleet. Most of our uh, site, uh, most of our offices are already using renewable energy source as well. So making big strides on our own carbon uh, reduction. And we've committed to uh, zero carbon across all of our activities by 2045. And just towards the bottom there, in fact, the very bottom one, just one that I'm very proud of, which is that our prompt payment performance, I've already mentioned that we're now paying more than 95% of our invoices within 60 days in the most recent six months. Across the previous 12 months, it was 93%. And that's all about treating our supply chain properly and fairly. So these are our sustainability commitments. We think, again, they are ambitious but achievable. And just to give you an example of why we've threaded sustainability and financial strategy together, because these things are, are, are in our view, completely intertwined. If we want the best people and we want the best clients, then we've got to have, uh, you know, that, then that's how we'll get the best uh, financial results. So this is an example of the kind of thing we're doing on our uh, projects. So the, the, this is obviously just a, a sort of pictograph. Um, but what we've done is we built a, a school a couple of years ago, and we've gone back and completely redesigned that school to be net zero carbon in use. So in other words, from uh, handing over to the client that's now, we've be redesigned it as a net zero carbon in use building. And that has made huge savings. It's probably halved the, uh, the CO2 across the life of that building. It's a slightly higher capital cost and a much lower cost in use. And I'm not an engineer, but the, the, some of the things that we do are very straightforward. So replacing uh, gas boilers with um, air source or ground source heat pumps, 
very straightforward. Putting PV panels on the roof or above the car lots, very straightforward. But we've also done things like changing the ventilation flows in the building to make sure that we're using the most efficient and effective ventilation flow. So really clever redesign. And this is all about us helping our clients to understand what's possible and, and moving our clients' buildings to net zero carbon if you like, is a push-pull thing. So we can encourage the clients and show them the art of the possible, and the clients need to also want to move down this journey with us. But this is something that we're seeing is increasingly important for our clients. So pulling all of this together, we sit here today with a really, really strong order book and an order book which supports our sustainable growth targets. So our order book is 3.3 billion pounds, 91% of it in the public and regulated sectors. And most importantly, 90% of our work for the new financial year through to June 2022 is already in hand. And more than 60% of our work for the year to June 2023 is already in hand in that order book. And the reason that's important is that gives us great selectivity. Nobody in the business is out chasing work to deliver this year to hit a number because actually we've already got that level of work secured that we need. Everybody in the business is incentivized around profit and cash and not growing the business with, with, with turnover. So the order book is fantastic quality. The order book underpins our margin aspirations as we go forward. And re I'm really proud of the level and quality of order book that we sat with uh, at the end of June 2021. So to summarize, and then I'll take, uh, I will take questions. The year to June 2021 was a great performance ahead of uh, expectations and ahead of our, our own uh, trajectory for growth. The business has got great foundations to grow going forwards. We've got a great outlook. The sectors that we operate in are strong and growing, and we're operating in the sectors which have got real opportunity to deliver sustainable, profitable growth for us going forwards. And that's given us the opportunity to set out these ambitious but achievable targets through to 2026. So with that, I'm very happy to take any questions. Andrew, thank you very much indeed for uh, updating investors this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just want the company to take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted today. I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, will be available via your Investor Meet company dashboard. And we'll send you an email when they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company. And as soon as this presentation has ended, we will redirect you for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. Andrew, I wonder if like, you'd be so kind to uh, open the Q&A tab. Uh, you'll see investors have submitted a number of questions. There was one, I think, that was uh, pre-submitted as well that I've just thrown in, into the mix for you as, as well. Um, if you'd be so kind to read out the questions and give a response where it's appropriate to do so, and I'll pick up from you at the end. Okay, I will do. So I'll, let me start with the pre-submitted question. Um, so please, can you explain how the PPI portfolio works in a bit more detail, and in particular, comment on cash flow, valuation, and returns each year? And secondly, the results statements mentioned an 11.8 million pound loss. Is that an error? Well, let me, let me deal with this on error. Let me deal with the second part. First of all, the 11.8 million is not just PPP. That was a combination of our PPP division, which made an operating loss of 1.8 million pounds and our central costs, uh, which, which were 10 million pounds in the year. So our PPP portfolio is largely PFI and NPD in Scotland. Um, uh, assets. Um, there's a portfolio of probably a dozen or more assets in there, which we've valued at a blended discount rate of 7%. That is a discount rate, which I think is uh, appropriate, but, but on the conservative side, uh, there is a real active secondary market for these assets. So we could uh, sell these assets in the market if we so chose, but we see good value in holding them. And those assets returned me 3.9 million pounds of interest in the year just finished. So uh, if you like, about 9% um, return on the fair value that we've got on the balance sheet. So a very good return. The PPP division itself operates, uh, it supports our co-development work in PRS and some other bid work. Um, and so the, the operating loss it made is, is a function of the, the costs of managing the portfolio and doing some of that bid work. And it does go up and down a little bit each year, depending on uh, when we get bid success fees in. So there's a, it's always a little bit lumpy in terms of in terms of the income. 
Um, but that's where the PPP asset portfolio, that interest income, I should say, because there's a question on cash flows, that interest income is cash interest income each year. So that's um, that is genuine interest, which goes into my EPS and obviously into my uh, dividend calculation. The next question, very topical, uh, is from Ben. It says, um, how are you managing costs, especially in relation to the much publicized inflation rises in materials and payroll? And will cost inflation impact our oper thin operating margins? And how will we manage this? Uh, so this is a very topical question. Uh, it's one that we get a lot at the moment, Ben. And, and, and I can say at the moment, uh, the, the materials inflation and the variability has had not, no significant impacts on our operations, no significant impact on our margins um, at all. So we're not immune, obviously, to inflation, but the way that we operate this is really twofold. So firstly, it's by working very closely with our supply chain. Um, and secondly, it's about how we tender for projects. So all of our work, when we tender it, we tender on current prices and we allow an allowance for inflation. So if it's a 12-month job or a 24-month job, we'll allow uh, inflation accordingly. And to the extent there are significant um, elements of the job, so for example, say a, a large part of the, the project was steel or steel-framed buildings, then what, on the day that we sign the contract with the client, we'll also look to sign the contract with our steel frame provider to lock in the price of the steel and also guarantee our availability slots. So, so we manage inflation uh, that way, and obviously as we price each new job, then, then, then we take in current pricing and current inflation into account. In terms of availability, you know, again, we've not had any significant impact of uh, the availability challenges, but what we have been doing is procuring early. So whereas previously we may have looked at a three-month lead time, we may be now looking at a six-month or a nine-month lead time. So as an example, I was on a site in Liverpool a couple of weeks ago. The site's got quite a big space in the car park, and they were pre-ordering materials earlier than they would probably have done a year ago. They had space to store those on site that we can make sure that we've got the materials on site that we don't affect the program. So, so that's how we manage this. So at the moment, as I say, we've, you know, we are managing it very carefully, but it is manageable because of the way we structure our contracts and the way that we procure materials. Um, actually, there's a similar question about supply chain issues, which I think is the same, uh, same question. The next question, uh, great results. So that's very kind, thank you. Uh, given the strength of the balance sheet, how big a part does M&A play in our strategy moving forwards? So we set out the strategy, the growth to £1.6 billion and 3% operating margin. We can see a route to do that organically. We think we can do that without uh, M&A. But equally, we think there is opportunity for some bolt-on M&A to accelerate that growth, to accelerate and, and expand our capabilities. So... So m and is something which is, um, in our minds, something that we, we may well do as part of our growing to that strategic objectives. But what we'll do is look at m and which, as I say, is uh, helping our capabilities, helping develop into adjacent markets, or helping accelerate those growth plans. So if you like, it's m and which is supportive of the strategy which I've outlined, as opposed to m and kind of as a, as a separate strategy in its own right. But we do think there are opportunities um, to, to do some bolt-on M&A. Do you think that the economics of air source heat pumps stack up for buildings of the future? <laughs> so we're increasingly seeing, this, um, this is a question from Mike, so we're increasingly seeing the use of air source and ground source heat pumps, so say um, on schools, uh, On we're doing a refurbishment in Bishopsgate at the moment, which is moving to air source heat pumps. So I think it does stack up. I think it stacks up probably easier for um, commercial properties or, or schools where you have a, an, an owner who's going to be owning that for the duration of uh, or long period of the asset's life. So they can look at the combination of cap upfront capital cost and uh, in-year uh, cost of running the building. Um, I think probably works easier in those than it would do in, we don't do private housing, but for example, in private housing where perhaps there is uh, more need to have the kind of uh, more equilibrium of the, the initial cost base. So I think we are seeing it increasingly uh, something which is helping our clients both in terms of new build and I say in terms of green retrofit. So, um, so and I think increasingly clients are understanding this 
you know, looking at the whole life cost as opposed to just capital costs. That's an increasingly important part of uh, what, what they're doing. So the next question, what is the company's strategy towards potential new acquisitions to grow in key markets? And do we have sufficient capital to support growth through new acquisitions without additional fundraising? So this is very sim similar to the previous question. So our, our strategy is to look at M&A where it is appropriate, where it supports that growth strategy. As I say, where there is the capabilities or the, uh, the market um, expertise, it may be geography, which, which, um, which supports the growth strategy. Clearly, um, the funding of that would depend on the particular the particular circumstance. It's quite hard to generalise, but there are some some bolt on acquisitions that I think we could certainly do without additional fundraising. But but obviously the precise nature of that would depend on the the individual opportunity that we're looking at. The next question. Um, you mentioned adjacent markets, PRS, green retrofit, water. How big a market opportunity do you, do you see here and how do you look to replace the competition and which one provides the greatest opportunity? Okay, so, so that's um, so, so a, few, a few parts of that question, um, Simon, which if I may just kind of unpick the different pieces. So I think what we see in terms of growing towards that 1.6 uh, by 2026, probably sort of half of that growth will be just by doing more of what we already do. Um, and certainly that part of the growth will be in the earlier part of the five year period. And then sort of half of the growth is probably by moving into these adjacent markets and will be uh, by necessity a little bit more back end loaded just because of the, the time. So, for example, in water, we operate in these five year cycles in England. You know, we see more opportunity probably towards the back end of the AMP7 moving into the AMP7 cycle. You know, in PRS, there is a quite a long gestation period. So in, GR, uh, in PRS, we do have um, some schemes. Uh, we've got two schemes already at preferred bidder, um, one, one down in Cardiff, for example, going through the planning process. So this is a market which we are, we've already done the groundwork in. We've appointed um, advisors to help us uh, find more sites because actually what we need is a slightly bigger pipeline so as these things work through the planning process we've got you know constant stream coming through into the into the construction phase and of course all of these we're going to construct with a forward funded position so it's sort of with, with, with a client in place so so again i think the, the prs will grow towards um towards the back end of the the the, the, the period but that is a real big market opportunity so PRS is probably a bit like student accommodation, which again is a market we operate in. A bit like student accommodation was probably five or 10 years ago. I, I think I'm right in saying that the single biggest PRS landlord in the UK has something like 1% of the market share. So it's a hugely fragmented market. Uh, at the moment, rentals is you know, largely driven by um, you know, people with one or two properties as opposed to big professional uh, landlords. And so we see this market really growing so I don't think it's so much about replacing the competition as this is a market which we see the market opportunity will grow. We're already well placed because we already build PRS schemes. We're doing a 665 unit scheme in Leeds at the moment. And so this is about us just moving into moving further into the, the value chain of that um, of that process. So so I think um, for sure PRS is a market, a big market opportunity. It's not so much about replacing competition. It's about it's about growing into this growing market. And I think green retrofit is very similar. So you know, we already do, um, as I say, that green retrofit or green work in our FM portfolio and our facilities management portfolio. We already have a business which does um, which does dry lining. And actually, so it's a, it's a sort of short hop to, to expand our capability, but this is a market which we see growing and so as opposed to having to take market share, we think this is a market which will grow significantly in the next few years because, you know, unless you were to take down and rebuild, you know, most of the UK built environment will stay in place. And so for the UK to reduce the carbon out, uh, footprint of its built environment, it needs to go in and, you know, take out single glazing and put in triple glazing. It needs to, say, change the ventilation, change, change the heating mechanism, change the, change the lights, fittings, and so on and so forth. So this is all about a growing 
market that we are very well placed to serve. So, so I think what we see is great opportunity, but it's not a kind of zero sum game. This is an opportunity where the markets are there to support that growth. Um, so moving on to the next question is from Mark. Um, please can you update us on the disputed contract claim? It's been going on for a while, any closer to a resolution. So what Mark is referring to is, uh, and we've been quite open in our uh, full year results statements, as, and as Mark alludes to probably for the last two or three reporting cycles, uh, we have three contracts, uh, all with a single client, which are going through the arbitration process um, at the moment. Um, these are contracts where we, we are no longer on site, so I'm not incurring money other than obviously a bit of legal fees. Um, so these are contracts where we expect to make a recovery. The arbitration process is uh, is slow. We've probably been going through the process for, uh, I'm guessing, sort of 18 months already. There's probably another 18 months or so for that process to run. Of course, there's no need for that process necessarily to run all the way through to the end, but, but that's the kind of timetable which... Um, which is in place if we were to run through to the end of the, the arbitration process. That, the, the recovery of those uh, of that claim is not uh, included in our forecast for the, for, the, uh, for the strategy period to 2026, not because we're not confident of our position, but because um, it wouldn't be prudent for me in terms of quantum or timing to know how much to include in our strategy plans. So, so Mark, that, that, that claim is is ongoing it is uh, is progressing I'm, as i say i'm afraid the um uh, arbitration process is you know is not a fast process which is why that will continue for for, for a number of months yet andrew i might just uh, jump in seeing as uh, so far every question that's coming from investors you've very kindly uh, given a response to and thank you to all those investors that have submitted questions um it may be an opportune time given that there are no uh, questions outstanding at the moment that uh, perhaps uh, i could hand back to you i know investor feedback is important we should certainly uh, be redirecting investors to provide you feedback very shortly but before doing so i wonder if you could uh, have a few closing comments yeah, absolutely. Well, look, Mike, really appreciate you, you giving me the opportunity and thank you to everybody who, who's asked the question. Um, so hopefully hopefully I answered those as, as fully as possible. Um, just really to reprise where, where we are, we've great foundations set from the previous strategy and from you know, the year to June 2021 was one which was an excellent operational performance, delivered financial results ahead of target, which is, which is always uh, very helpful. As I say here today, we've got a great order book and a really great pipeline of work. Our markets are really supportive, so there's a real great outlook uh, for the markets that we operate in, and some of these markets are growing as we've, as we've spent time talking about. And so we're very confident with this strategy we've put in place through to, to 2026. We think this is appropriate both in terms of being socially responsible and in terms of giving great sustainable financial returns to our shareholders. So, so we sit here very happy with where we're sat and really pleased with the outlook. So, so really, really, Mark, that is that's the summary of the position. So, thank you for thank you again for taking the time to to, to listen to it this afternoon. Andrew, thank you, and thank you for updating investors this afternoon. Um, can I please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. This one will take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the management team. On behalf of the team at Galliford Tri Holdings, we'd like to thank you very much for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Thank you for your time and good afternoon to you all.